going to Pepperland. Welcome back, everybody, to the first Vinyl Monday of 2024! I'm Abby, I have a lot of records, and this is my series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30-minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, and on TikTok. So this week's album isn't so much an album. For one of the first times in Vinyl Monday history, we are not covering a studio album today. This is what happens when you guys make requests, things get a little weird. This will be an episode unlike anything I've done before. This week's album, the belated 25,000 subscriber special is... Yellow Submarine by The Beatles! Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls sometimes where you can pick what albums you want to see on the show. I make announcements when I'm places that isn't here. You can find all of that on my channel. Alright, for the first time in 2024, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a US repress on Apple Records from 1971. I had to turn to Discogs to snag this one. The only other time I've seen a decent yellow submarine in a record store, it was priced at like $50. Not sure what's up with that, but okay. I know what you're thinking, Abby. You really should have the Yellow Submarine song track, and I agree, I would love to be holding up the song track for you today. But after the holidays, and before a last minute trip to New York City that I should be on as we speak, that is, if we don't get bombed by snow, I do not have the funds to spend $100 on a little yellow plastic disc that spins and plays music, okay? So the designer of this cover art isn't listed anywhere officially, but we know the art director for the Yellow Submarine film was Heinz Edelman, so uh, it's safe to assume that one or two people working underneath him designed this. Here we have all the Beatles character designs, plus the Blue Meanies, Jeremy, Old Fred, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and the titular Yellow Submarine. On the back cover, we have our track listing for both the soundtrack and the score on this album, and we have liner notes written by Dan Davis. On Yellow Submarine, we of course have the Beatles. That's John Lennon on vocals, guitar, piano, harpsichord, ukulele, which I didn't know he knew how to play before this, banjo, harmonica, and glockenspiel, Paul McCartney on vocals, bass, some guitar, trumpet, which I also didn't know he knew how to play, and double bass, George Harrison on guitar, Hammond organ, and violin, just guess what I'm gonna say about that, and providing lead vocals for only a northern song and it's all too much, shocked that he didn't play the sitar anywhere on these songs, and Ringo Starr on drums, percussion, and providing lead vocals for the title track. For some reason they're not credited on the album, I had to seek out this information for myself, but we have two guest producers working on the score, John Burgess and Ron Richards. This is very rare for Beatle history. Production, orchestral arrangements, and piano on All You Need Is Love were all provided by George Martin. This was engineered by Jeff Emmerich. Roll transition. <laughs> Okay, so, to begin with, the Yellow Submarine Saga is running in tandem with not one, but two major events in Beatle history. Production on Magical Mystery Tour and The White Album. No, I am not covering The White Album anytime soon, even though it is my favorite Beatles album. I would need to make another feature film length video to unravel all of that. Full disclosure, this timeline is like a tangled ball of yarn and it is going to be murder to iron out. So one, it can't 
can't really be organized 100% chronologically like I normally do with this chapter of the video, and two, I'm going to leave out most specific to the White Album happenings. The Yellow Submarine story actually begins all the way back in 1963 when the Beatles sign a three-film deal with United Artists. Number one was A Hard Day's Night, a huge hit and widely considered the best Beatle film. Britannia, Britannia rules the... <laughs> Number two was Help, still loved, but less so than its predecessor. The Beatles didn't like this one too much at all. Film number three would have been Magical Mystery Tour, right? Wrong. Magical Mystery Tour was a made-for-TV special. The United contract specified that all three of these films must be released in theaters. However, it didn't specify that all three had to be live action. Brian Epstein, in particular, saw the benefits of an animated Beatles film. It would cement the band's legacy in a new way, one that no other band had really played with before this. Plus, an animated film could still fulfill United's contractual obligations so long as the guys were involved in some capacity. With the continuing Sgt. Pepper's madness and all, the guys are way too busy to have starring roles in another live-action deal. Oh yeah, this is all overlapping with Sgt. Pepper's 2, by the way. In May of 1967, just about a month before Sgt. Pepper's release, Brian Epstein signs off on the third film deal. Yellow Submarine is born. It initially has an 11-month timeline and 250,000 pound budget. That is about 5.8 million US dollars today. The story is by Lee Minoff. He loosely based the film around the song of the same name originally released on Revolver. So he basically wrote lore for the Beatles extended cinematic universe. The film's screenplay was written by Jack Jack Mendelssohn and Eric Segal. Eric wasn't brought on board until much later, we'll get into that. And in the DVD's special features, production manager John Coates says Roger McGough did a lot of uncredited script work. He's from Liverpool, so a lot of the Liverpoolian quips came from him. Once the writing team is assembled and director George Dunning is brought on board, production really kicks into gear. Over 200 animators are brought on board, hand-drawing each frame under the direction of Jack Stokes and Heinz Edelman. No, the art was not by Peter Max. It was by Heinz. Though his style does look a little bit like Peter's, I think, especially when you take into account the really long legs. They tried to put me on the cover of Vogue, but my legs were too long. Fun fact, the blue meanies weren't actually supposed to be blue. One of Heinz Edelman's assistants screwed up and accidentally changed the colors and they just kind of rolled with it. That is the theme of a lot of Yellow Submarine's production. They based the art style around the general psychedelic feel of the Beatles music and the Beatles themselves off of these photos from the Sgt. Pepper's release party. Heinz had a vision for this film. Since it was a jukebox musical, the art style style should vary slightly to suit every song. This would hold the audience's attention through the non-musical parts. Now, aside from being caught up in Sgt. Pepper's Hullabaloo, the other reason the Beatles aren't super involved with Yellow Submarine is because of who's making it. Al Brodax and his production company, King Features, were at the helm. They were famously, or maybe infamously, responsible for the campy Beatles cartoon that aired here in the States. The Beatles had nothing to do with the Beatles TV show, thought it and King were a joke, and made it expressly clear that they would not star in Yellow Submarine. Instead, to comply with the terms of the United contract, they would provide four new songs for the film's soundtrack. Not only are the Beatles too busy with Sgt. Pepper's and too busy avoiding Al Brodax, they're too busy with another film's production. The beautiful disaster that is Magical Mystery Tour. Personally, I feel comfortable calling Magical Mystery Tour an unmitigated disaster from start to finish. What began as a concept sketch Paul drew at Brian Wilson's house after chewing some celery for a song became a directionless mess 
plagued by production issues. Will I revisit it someday to cover the film? I don't know. Let's see how this thing goes first. The first song the Beatles contributed to Yellow Submarine was only a northern song, recorded between February and April of 67 at EMI Studios. It was originally in consideration to be on Sgt. Pepper's. John and Paul passed this one up in favor of another George tune, Within You Without You. Yeah, it sounds like nobody but George even remotely liked this song. Even George Martin didn't like it, which is wild to me because he allowed an awful lot of far worse Beatles songs to be made. So into the Yellow Submarine pilot went. That made a lot louder of a slap than I thought it was going to. Paul's All Together Now was cut in May, about a month after Sgt. Pepper's production wrapped. This song was born of the same session as Baby You're a Rich Man. George's It's All Too Much was also recorded in May, and this one is interesting. For one, we don't know for sure who says what right here. I feel it's safe to assume it's John, but what he's saying is another matter entirely. I have no idea. And this is one of the few Beatles tracks not recorded at Abbey Road. It's All Too Much was recorded at Delane Lee and only finished by George Martin in June. The full version is said to be around eight minutes long. This was way too long for the film. No one had storyboarded an eight minute long scene and too long for an intended EP. Therefore, it was cut to six and a half minutes for release here. Clearly that must be the version that's in the film. Right? Work on both Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine is halted in wake of Brian Epstein's death in August of 67. This is around where Yellow Submarine production veers off the tracks. After several rounds of edits on the script, Al Brodax decides he wants a complete rewrite and he wants it right now. Enter Eric Segal. Al calls Eric like, hey, this is Big Al Brodax. I'm not kidding, this is actually how this blowhard introduced himself on the phone. We need a rewrite, and we need it fast. How fast? In three weeks! This is around where poet Roger McGough is brought on too, as the Beatles need to sound more British. Growing increasingly worried about the direction of something with their names attached to it, John and Paul took to calling the studio with plot suggestions. This scene where the submarine is following Ringo around Liverpool, that was John's idea. On Boxing Day 1967, Magical Mystery Tour premieres on the BBC. This thing went over just about as well as a lead balloon. It's nonsensical and weird with no contiguous plotline to be found as the bus footage that Paul meant to be the plot, yeah, most of it wasn't usable. The bus got stuck in traffic. It can be hard to settle into if you're not a die-hard Beatle fan, and even if you are, it still might not be your thing. To add insult to injury, this thing was shot in color but aired in black and white, so it just looked like sh**. Critics savaged the thing top to bottom. If the Beatles weren't enthused to be doing another film to begin with, then they definitely aren't now. But in late January of 68, the guys still will themselves to film their live action cameo. The guys were supposed to be blended in with the animation, but the budget was just obliterated at this point, so it's just the four of them standing in front of a black screen. So to recap, the Beatles have handed in only a Northern song, All Together Now, and It's All Too Much. United accepts the three, but requests one more. John demoed Hey Bulldog in late 67, early 68 at his house. It was sort of a half-baked blues vamp with the recurring lyric, She Can Talk To Me, used as a placeholder. On February 11th, 1968, just four days before the guys are due to head to India, they head into the studio with every intention of filming a video for Lady Madonna. Instead, they end up working on Hey Bulldog. The last take of the day was deemed the best, the overdubs are slapped right onto that, Jeff and George Martin pitch it up slightly in post. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this Lady Madonna video, aside from those clips of 
of John and Paul in the booth very clearly singing Lady Madonna. Yeah, the guys are actually playing Hey Bulldog. After completing Hey Bulldog, not Lady Madonna, the Beatles head off to India where the White Album was born. Cue all of the ensuing White Album shenanigans, six month or so time skip, the Yellow Submarine track listing goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have our title track, Yellow Submarine, followed by Only a Northern Song. Then, All Together Now. Next, Hey Bulldog. Then, It's All Too Much. And side one closes with All You Need Is Love. Opening up side two, we have our score, beginning with Pepperland. Then, The Medley, Sea of Time and Sea of Holes. Next, Sea of Monsters. Then, March of the Meanies. Next, Pepperland Laid Waste, and the album closes with Yellow Submarine in Pepperland. Yellow Submarine, the album, is released in January of 1969. To give you some perspective on when this thing finally hit the shelves, even though all the Yellow Submarine material was recorded first, it came out two months after the release of the White Album. In about two weeks, the guys would play the rooftop show. So we've now overlapped with the Get Back timeline and the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus, which John performed at in December of 68. And through all of this, George Harrison is working on the Wonderwall soundtrack. Quick time skip back to July of 1968. <laughs> the Yellow Submarine film premieres in the UK. Ringo and Maureen were there. John attended with his new girlfriend, Yoko Ono. One of the most stylish couples of the 60s, George and Patty Harrison showed up looking like this. George's suit was yellow, which totally made him look like the man in the yellow suit from Curious George. Baby darling sweetheart, love of my life, Keith Richards was there. The Who were there with one of my other favorites, Pete Townsend. Twiggy showed up in the cutest little yellow dress and Paul went stag. This might have something to do with the impending end of his engagement to Jane Asher. All of three days later, she dumped him on live television. Breakups and divorces and yellow suits, oh my. This is a weird point in time for Yellow Submarine to be premiered. Right now, the guys are knee-deep in White Album production and forming Apple Corps. They're also dealing with the closing of that boutique they had with The Fool. Though the world was still in its happy hippie phase, singing all you need is love and all that, the Beatles have kind of grown out of that. So, if the film was initially released in July, why was the soundtrack delayed to January of the next year? The plan was to release just an EP with just just the four new songs, like they did with Magical Mystery Tour in the UK. But since it was so close to the intended White Album release, uh, this plan was scrapped. Instead, they'd smush the EP and the score together and just delay its release by a few months. In this time, re-recordings on the score took place on October 22nd and 23rd with George Martin and his orchestra at EMI. Why Martin decided to re-record everything three whole months after the film came out, I have no idea. God, this production was such a mess. The US film release finally came in November of 68, just a week before the White Album came out. In recent years, Hey Bulldog has received mass reappraisal. It even made the cut for the 2023 Blue Album. For a long time, it was one of the hidden gems of the Beatle catalog, so... Why did it fly under the radar for so long? Well, in the US version of Yellow Submarine, the Hey Bulldog scene was cut. In one of the more wild things I've heard in my research, okay, the editors gave a shortened Yellow Submarine to the US market because get this, audiences would be bored by the long runtime. The long runtime in question? 89 minutes an hour and a half. For context, 2001 A Space Odyssey came out before Yellow Submarine. 
That movie is 161 minutes long. Did the New York critics trash that one? Yes, but did the San Francisco hippies, the intended audience of Yellow Submarine, love it? Yes! So what the f were these editors on about? So here in the United States, we just didn't have the full Yellow Submarine until 1999, the year I was born. Also cut from the film, four minutes of It's All Too Much. So for those of you keeping track at home, this went from an eight minute song to a six and a half minute song to just over two minutes. At that point, just ask for a different song. Oh, hey, did I mention the Yellow Submarine score was used in NASA's Apollo 9 mission film? As it almost always goes, you know, except for Maxwell's Silver Hammer, the guys warmed up to it after the fact. Even John, who was the number one Beatles hater, came around. This was John's favorite because his son Sean loved it so much. Maybe George's admiration wasn't so sincere. He said his favorite part of the movie was that he didn't have to work on it. He could just hand in the songs and be done. Side note, in George's interview for the VH1 Yellow Submarine special, he sat in front of the piano that The Fool painted for the Beatles. There was an attempted remake of Yellow Submarine in the 2010s by the same studio that did The Polar Express. Beautifully written film, horrifying animation. The project was scrapped after the studio was shut down. I'm honestly kind of glad this happened. This one has kind of a weird legacy. As far as the film goes, it's pretty favorably remembered. Critics and audiences loved it upon release. Oh, you've gotta be fucking kidding me! And it got a second wind after restoration efforts in the 90s. But this album is maybe the most maligned Beatles release. Do I think Phil Spector's Let It Be is more deserving of that title? Yes. Justice for Glyn Johns's Get Back. But what do I think of Yellow Submarine? <laughs> Going in, this is unlike any other Vinyl Monday I have ever done, seeing as in order to review this album, I have to review an entire fucking film. So let's have another go around, I guess. What do I think of Yellow Submarine? To your Okay, everybody, please, please go easy on me here. This is obviously a first for Vinyl Monday, a show about vinyl. I have not reviewed a film in any capacity since I planned on minoring in film in college, but in the chaos of writing two undergrad theses for my art history major, because yes, I did hate myself, I just forgot to hand in the minor paperwork. Going in. This is my favorite of the Beatles films. A Hard Day's Night is objectively the best, but a lot of the British humor flies over my pretty American head. Help is just plain weird, and Magical Mystery Tour is, um, fractured pieces that could never quite come together into a very ambitious whole. Yellow Submarine is like my Goldilocks of Beatles films. It's just right for this weirdo Alice in Wonderland loving hippie chick. Check out this Alice in Wonderland teapot my sister got me for Christmas. It's so cute. The plot reminds me of Alice in Wonderland meets Sleeping Beauty meets The Wizard of Oz. Pepperland is captured and frozen in time by the joy and fun hating Blue. Ooh, meanies. Pepperland resident Old Fred escapes in the mayor's titular yellow submarine to retrieve the Beatles, who are the only ones who can save Pepperland. Together they travel through various fantasy realms, picking up Dr. Jeremy Hillary Boob and getting into various hijinks along the way. After losing the submarine, the Beatles disguise themselves as Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Through the power of music and love, they defeat the Blue Meanies and save Pepperland. As Heinz Edelman said in the VH1 special, this film is a sort of biography of the people who worked on it. 
Strangely enough, it is a documentary of the 60s. Oddballs freeing the world with peace and love. That's a documentary of the happy hippie 60s if I've ever seen it. The story is great, but this is not the best written Beatles film. Uh, it's pretty clear the script was haphazardly thrown together and needed to go through more drafts and edits. There are these random references to American history left over from earlier versions of the script. The references to the other Beatles songs are cute, like Help, A Day in the Life, the title track, Getting Better, I Am the Walrus. I didn't get a lot of the British humor, so I got my enjoyment from other aspects. There's really an awful lot of traveling through various voids and lands, so the music and shifting art styles hold my interest. The voice acting is acceptable. Ringo was by far the best voice of the bunch. For the longest time, I thought that for some reason, Ringo was the only Beatle who took part in Yellow Submarine. Ringo's really the audience foil in this story. He's the Beatle we meet first, he gets to do all the fun stuff like being ejected from the ship, and he befriends Jeremy first. It might be a jukebox musical, but what really pays the price of admission is the animation. It's a visual encapsulation of what the 60s were all about. It's got this lush, rich color palette, everything from deep blues and greens to bright oranges, pinks, even teal, and they're all used together. Maybe the hardest colors to use together are red and green, but Yellow Submarine does it a lot by pairing an almost orangey crimson with an acid slash apple green. This is one of my favorite color combos and I love to see it. So where did this quintessentially 60s style come from? Well, let's take a look at all the influences of psychedelic art. It starts with Art Nouveau. Swirls and lush florals, motifs of moons and suns. We see this a lot on concert posters of the era. See this one from Pink Floyd and this one for Cream. Then we have Art Deco, like the relief carvings in what I call the Beetle Lair. Uh, we get a lot of Victorian revival too, not just in the fashion, but in the art. This is most prominent in the Eleanor Rigby sequence, also seen in the When I'm 64 shoes. Eleanor Rigby is special because it blends this Victorian style, kind of like what Klaus Vormann did for the revolver art with pop art elements, figures colored like Andy Warhol's screen prints. The only a Northern song scene was inspired by Richard Avedon's photos of the Beatles for Look magazine. I have prints of these. And I'm pretty sure the big ear, as I like to call it, inspired Barry Godber's art for In the Court of the Crimson King. The Sea of Holes is a nod to Yayoi Kusama. Uh, there's a fair amount of nods to the 1920s, we'll get into this a little bit later. Surrealism, specifically René Magritte, uh, there's a fair amount of abstraction. Dadaism, repeated motif of the pointing glove in both Blue Mini design and the typography. And there's even reference to Yoko Ono's art. John met Yoko after being captivated by her piece Ceiling Painting, uh, where you'd climb a ladder in the gallery and use a magnifying glass to spy the word yes written on the ceiling. Put all of that together, that's the 60s. That's Yellow Submarine. There's also a pretty sick blend of media to mimic texture. The charcoal and pencils used in the blue meanie layer, watercolors and inks for the water splash, stone, leaves, and colored pencil clouds. As far as animation goes, there are highs and lows. There are some blips like reusing animations and objects appearing or disappearing. Maybe the most noticeable were the green apples just sort of appearing out of nowhere. Altogether now appears twice too. This is indicative of the time crunch and budget constraints. The only a Northern song sequence came off as lazy to me. All we get are the Avedon style Beatles portraits and some sound waves. One of the most famous 
sequences is the foothills slash Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds scene, where rotoscoping is used to reference iconic dance scenes from the golden age of Hollywood. I know a lot of people love this scene, even I was swayed by the Lady Godiva sort of sequence, but rotoscoping in general falls into the uncanny valley, I think it's creepy. The zany moments are great, like a uh, Frankenstein turning into John and nonsensical sh posty submarine physics making me laugh. My favorite musical sequence is the other most famous scene from this movie, Eleanor Rigby. There's references to old British illustration, Victorian fashion plates, scene paintings, Liverpool life post-World War II. I love the muted colors used in an Andy Warhol way, and faces of the cast and crew superimposed onto figures. The Nowhere Man scene is underrated. It's hilarious once you realize it's the Beatles roasting poor Jeremy so hard that he cries. The Beatles are miming their instruments, except for Ringo, he's relegated to hand claps. The rotating revolver sequence was incredibly hard to do with the constantly shifting perspective. I also love the creative character entrances and segues. The a day in the life crescendo for the submarine takeoff, manipulations of samples from the title track, think for yourself, and I think within you without you. Unsurprisingly, my favorite moment of the entire film is George's entrance. It uses an excerpt from Love You Too. This scene is actually how I discovered that song. There are so many references to Hinduism, I could go on about this scene. The tower of William Morris-esque swirls in dark purples and greens. I'm pretty sure that's a reference to the William Morris floral jacket from Granny Takes a Trip that George owned. This whole very vertical design, this poster of Vishnu, the same one that inspired the Axis Bold as Love Art. As for the music we get in the film, listen. My speakers on my TV are far from state of the art. But even then, I was hearing stuff I've never heard before. I watched the 1999 remaster of the film so I would get the Hey Bulldog scene. This is the only time in Beatles history, aside from Phil Spector's Let It Be, where someone who is not named Martin got to handle Beatles music. Peter Cobbin remixed, or rather rebuilt, these songs from the ground up, from the source tapes at Abbey Road. And they sound really, really good. The best of the bunch is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I honestly wish the 2017 mix was modeled after this 1999 mix. Love You Too is a very close second. It's way better than the version we got on 2022 Revolver. I won't spend much time on the score since I don't think very many of you are here for that, but it's nice. It's whimsical and sweet, and in my opinion, it has a lot of life on its own outside of the film. On to the music. Wikipedia calls the Yellow Submarine soundtrack a studio album. Literally no Beatles fan does. I don't think any of us consider this canon like we do Magical Mystery Tour. Because once you subtract the film score, the title track that came from Revolver, and All You Need Is Love that appeared on the Magical Mystery Tour album, you only get those four songs. That's an EP. You know, the format this should have been in in the first place. Why the original soundtrack songs aren't in the order in which they appear in the film is beyond me. If you're going by the first time All Together Now is played, then it'd be All Together Now, Northern, Hey Bulldog, It's All Too Much. If you're going by All Together Now being the end credits song, then it would be Northern Song, Hey Bulldog, It's All Too Much, All Together Now. Instead of either of those sequences, these songs were put in the silliest order whoever was in charge of this could have possibly thought up. Does that irk me? Yes. Uh, but if you need to gauge how good a band was, don't consider their big hits. Examine what they considered the throwaway songs. Only a Northern song feels like the child of Blue Jay Way. It's got a similarly dark psych feeling. 
I do like the organ, how it's spacier in the beginning, then plays with some almost trafficy stuff. But this is the weakest song of the bunch. These songs were meant to be written for a movie. Yes, only a northern song didn't provide much imagery for the animators to work with, which is maybe why that scene in the movie feels lazy. The vocal line is eerily similar to You Won't See Me. And Polly, I love you, but your trumpet is dreadful. Altogether now is so stinking cute. This song gets stuck in my head at all the best, most inopportune times. When you hear that guitar in the beginning, you can just see the Beatles at the end of the movie in your head. Maybe Altogether Now's saving grace is it appearing here. I don't think it could have existed outside of the context of Yellow Submarine, if that makes any sense. Like in an alternate universe where we got this song on the White Album instead of, I don't know, Obla Di Obla Da. I promise you, I would be clowning on All Together Now so hard, but it's here on an animated movie soundtrack, so it's comfy at home. If there's an alternate universe in which All Together Now got slapped onto an album, then there is also an alternate universe in which Hey Bulldog was on the White Album. I am a little mad we don't live in that universe. This is unreasonably good. I cannot believe the Beatles considered this a throwaway song. The late 60s Beatles perfected the art of the riff, especially in John songs. This is a monster riff, so good that the piano just has to follow along. Even Ringo's drumming it out, that's a very melodic pattern. When I think of Ringo's drumming style, I don't think of melodic or flashy, so when he pulls that, it's quite intentional, and it has a cool effect on the momentum of the song. Do the lyrics run out of ideas pretty quickly? Yes, that's indicative of John not really putting much thought into them. But let the record show, I love a good John nonsense song, I Am The Walrus Has Entered The Chat. This feels like a more grounded I Am The Walrus, where without the Disney backup singers and the zany tape effect, but the wordplay is still there. Childlike, no one understands, jackknife in your sweaty hands is a standout lyric. The danger of acting on feverish emotion, self-pity, and immaturity. Note sweaty hands. Two of them. The subject is so pitiful, he has to hold this weapon like a little kid. Like how a kid holds a plastic cup with two hands. Like I have to do every time I drink from a plastic cup because I am a 24-year-old toddler who drops everything. After Hey Bulldog received its due appraisal in recent years, Yellow Submarine still holds a hidden gem of the Beatles catalog. It's all too much. This song gets even weirder and more fascinating when you consider that in the film, the two minutes of the song that we got, there's a lost verse. To this day, in our year of the Lord, 2024, there has never been a full version of It's All Too Much released. This is one of the last great Beatle mysteries to be solved, and It's All Too Much remains the last truly underrated Beatles song. Our of thought is almost immediately interrupted by distorted guitar and feedback. It's like your tab kicking in when you least expect it. Then we're taken on a feverish psychedelic journey. This song is about George's experiences on the Sid with his wife Patty. It's important to note that these lyrics were written before the San Fran trip that changed his ideas on psychedelics completely. The layered organ and keys set the tone. The guitar work here is amazing, among the best on any Beatles song. It's textured, sometimes blown out, and warped with pedals. I love the punch of the hand claps, and whatever they did underneath it, I still can't tell, and the way it drives the song along. George sings this exotic melody in a manner that slightly drags behind the rest of the song. It makes you feel like you're on this overwhelming euphoric high with him. I can almost see the silver sun he's singing about rising over the birthday cake mountain. And it ends with distant beetle 
people chanting like disembodied voices. Is this song a little bit of an indulgence? Yes. Do I love every second of it? Yes. This trumpet fanfare is 100% more listenable than Northern Song. Yellow Submarine may have been a slog to make but it seldom shows. While it's far from perfect, its flaws give it a human touch. That's what Yellow Submarine is about, really. The uniquely human experience of making life an adventure. Looking on the bright side of things, injecting color and music where there isn't, making fun of the mundane and making fun out of the mundane. There's a childlike joy within it, that which reflects the optimism of the 60s. Considering the whole experience, film and songs, Yellow Submarine is the definitive picture of the Beatles version of Psych. From art and animation to music and sound, it's a picture of high psychedelia as young people of the 60s were experiencing it. What a delight Yellow Submarine is. My personal favorites on this one are Hey Bulldog, and it's all too much. My favorites off the score are Pepperland and Yellow Submarine in Pepperland. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it! That is the 25,000 subscriber special Yellow Submarine Extravaganza. What do you think of this album? What do you think of the film? What do you think of the song track? What do you think of... Blue meanies. I don't know. Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!